So welcome to The Recovery Project. Um, have you ever felt that at times where you've been told that you've had cancer, testicular cancer, and then during that phase, particularly in the early years, that you were in a crash and witnessed your friend passing away and you held that grief and that guilt for all those years? Have you also felt that you lived with autoimmune disease for a number of years and the struggle was real? Have you also had cancer from friends and past individuals that you live with and loved and witnessed that? We certainly have. Have you had double pneumonia and as a 12 year old and having to live through that? In fact, she thought she was going to die, but she made it through. And this is why I think we brought these stories um, to a heed and to understand the learnings and the grief that people have lived with and the recovery stories, which is more important. Yeah, we're moving on to a totally different theme today because so far it's been all chronic illness as in a physical illness. Today we're talking to a recovered drug addict. So this is quite a different slant because recovery comes in many forms. So, you know, this is an area that's intriguing um, for me because I haven't had many clients for this. I've had all the physical illness clients. So it's going to be really interesting to hear a different slant. Mira, I love your stories. I know you are well, well. I know your daughter is uh, floating around somewhere, but that's all good. We That's how we flow in this uh, this world we live in. Yeah. Hey, so I am Amira. I'm 30 years old. I am a single mum of three sons. They are 13, 6, and 3, and they are busy, busy boys. Um, I... I don't even know where to start with myself. Um, so I was raised myself by a single mum as well. Um, my mum was an amazing mum. Um, she's 36 years sober in AA and is just absolutely incredible. And so I was raised kind of by a tribe of single women that were sorting their lives and, you know, growing and learning together. And it was just a really kind of cool upbringing. Um, and I guess I had the seeds planted in me young to make the right choices but I guess that doesn't always mean you do. There's seven years between my two older kids for a reason. So there's seven years between Kitty Amara and Ashley, and that's because I carry so much guilt around not being a present mum for Kitty Amara, around not being ready to be a mum, you know, like I'm getting emotional about it. And I vowed that I wouldn't have another kid until I was able to be there and to provide for my child and to be a present mother to them. And so I got in my contraception taken out to have Ashley, you know, like he was a planned baby and my ex's mum has some serious mental health issues and wrote a big stuff lie of a statement. And I don't know if you know the family court system, but in them, if it's accepted, you then have to, you are then a response. So you're like, they're the applicant. And if it's granted, you then have to respond to it. But so it got granted and she then got care of my kid instantly mm. before I even got a chance to respond to her bullshit and that ripped my heart out and the only way that I at that time knew how to deal with that pain was just my crack and it made it go away um on so many levels you know like it made emotional you know like it made the hurt first of most go away and it helped with the anger and then eventually I just started to forget, you know, like the day, you know, like I used to not be able to go two minutes without thinking about my baby. And then it would be two hours and then eventually I could go two days, you know, and I just wanted to not feel because I didn't know how to deal with my reality. Um, mm. Did you want, and, did any stage, Mary, did you want to give up your life? Absolutely. Yeah, I... But I was too pussy, if I'm being honest with you. I was too scared to do it. Like... Mm. And I know, and I think it's a really selfish act. And as selfish as I was in my using, I didn't, I didn't realize at that time how my using was implicating the people around me, my family, my mum, you know, like, and beyond that, I didn't realize the ripple effect my using was having. But I think in my head, I understood that if I died, I couldn't do that to my mum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and that always kind of, you know, because my mum's only ever had me, and I've only ever had my mum until I had my own kids, and I just. I just couldn't do that to her, and that's mm. what always kind of kept me here. Was that you know when you've you've experienced a lot, like you've you've put it probably simply in a short message, right? In your life, like 
yeah. your mother like always there so what were you seeking do you think during that period what were you after if you were trying to band-aid all the emotions that you had because one a few of them come up resentment was one and guilt was the other yeah I just wanted to be loved at the end of it and it always had come back to that for me I've never I should have started with I've never met my dad <laughs> maybe that could have been a good start <laughs> I think that's a big start right mm. in terms of who you are and yeah. having I guess that masculinity and that femininity packaged together mm. like your mum had all the love but then you probably needed dad right to yeah. put down the guidelines and reinforce it dad got murdered in 2003 so that's kind of something that I'll have to deal with too and then my brother committed mm. suicide so there's this whole family in Scotland that I still have to go meet and that is a really big part of my feeling empty my whole life I think through my recovery I do some NA and, and part of that is the 12 steps and so through your step work you kind of do some work around resentments because resentment is kind of like the number one reason you would relapse you know like in the program we say you know like mm. resentment is the number one cause of relapse and so I try to work around my resentments a lot and because resentments come in lots of different forms as well like you can be resentful to the dairy owner for upping the price of your milk or you know you can be resentful to your to your father for never being in your life you know but that's yeah. still a resentment we can intellectually know that something's stupid, but feel it in our body, though. Like, yeah. you know, an intellectual knowing and a body gut feel are two such different things. Absolutely. Like that's how we can intellectualize something like using meth or, you know, there's always a way your head can justify something, even when you're Yeah, always, never me and mum end up in an argument. It always comes back to, I wish you'd just listened to me. You never hear what I'm saying. I think I feel unheard by my mum, and I think I'm quite resentful around that, mm. probably. Yeah. Um, and she kind of treats me like a kid still, but I also have to realise I acted like a child for a really long fucking time. <laughs> um, so I might deserve that a little bit, you know. Like, I haven't even gotten into my messy bit of my story yet. I feel like <laughs> which is the worst part. <laughs> what is the messy? What is the messy yeah. part? Because that was my right. next question. Did you right reach off. a crisis point? Using, am I using just spiraled really quickly? Um, after about two and a half months, Mum tried to send me to rehab in Auckland. And it was like a nine and a half hour trip up there from Wanganui to Auckland. It is not that long to get from Wanganui to Auckland normally. It's like five hours maybe. Because I'd gotten a gram, sorry to be so straight up, but I got an a gram on the way and I made her stop at every toilet telling her I needed to do a poo. Like every town, <laughs> I need a poo. So that I could smoke me up on the toilet on the, way to, on the way to rehab. And I threw my pipe out in the sanitary bin at the Carl's Jr. on the corner. And showed up high as to rehab. Clearly, I didn't get clean at that stage of my life. I, um, <laughs> I'll bet half the people turn up to rehab already green. high, though. <laughs> yeah, lived a couple of weeks clean and then went home because I was fist. Um, the other problem is when you fly to Wanganui from Auckland, so there's like the airport, and my best friend, who was also my dealer, lived <laughs> before the first round about to get into town. So I like left the airport, stopped at the drug house. <laughs> oh. Got really you know, like I hadn't even crossed the bridge to Wanganui and I would relapse. I think I spent like a couple of hours here and he's like, I'm so proud of you. And then we sat down and smoked lots of meat together. Wow. Um, so they try to teach you at rehab? Like what was, you know, it clearly didn't work, but I'm just curious what I went you were back, doing. I went there. back and fixed myself eventually to a different one though. Um, they thought the real 12 step based rehab. I just wasn't ready for it. I just, I know that, and I know that more, more than anything, you can force people to do, you mm. can send someone to like a $20 billion rehab with all the luxuries, mm. and they won't want to be there if they don't want to be there, man. Yeah. Then, so that was going on, and as I talked about my best friend before, um, he was a guy, and he was the only person, and him and his family, um, even though he was dealing drugs, they... It saved my life. Like, I had burnt all my bridges when I lost my baby. I was miserable. I was sad. I had nowhere to be. Like, I was homeless for three years. And I don't mean living on the street homeless. You know, like, I just didn't have my own home. I was couch surfing. I was here. I was there. And it was just really rough. And they always had a hot meal. They always had a shower. They always had a couch or a bed or, you know, like, they really took me in and gave me that sense of family that I'd always craved, even though there was drugs being sold from there as well. But... I think part of that too was that he knew if he supplied my drugs, I because if he wasn't giving them to me, I was going to go get myself in trouble somewhere else and get them. And I'd done that, you know, like during my using, he'd got locked up and I'd try, oh, anyway, it was a shit show. Um, and so a lot of that was from love too, I think, which is really weird. But so I'd gone to do his groceries one day and he got murdered. Um, mm. 
I left the house and within 12 minutes of me leaving his property, a couple of cars had pulled down the driveway. They attacked his brother. He got shot six times. They left. His sister came and called 111. And I'm at the supermarket doing his groceries, like oblivious to what's going on. Oh. And emotionally, like I was a mess. I was cooked as fuck. I was like sleepless. I My best friend had just died. I was like crying. My boyfriend didn't love me properly. Crash through someone's mm. fence. You're like, I was just worst day ever. And like I was an emotional, like my head was not mm. functioning in any form of functioning way a head should function. And I remember chasing Michael across the road. He was running, he ended up running from me. And I remember chasing him across the road and I was like, just love me. <laughs> well, I was like trying to hit him in the back of the head, like toxic as shit. But you know, like, and that's where it always comes back to for me, you know, like I just wanted that love. Mm. And yeah. so the police showed up because it was a huge domestic in the middle of the road and at like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning while everyone was going to work. But I ended up getting charged with my driving that day. Um, I got done for assault with a weapon. Um, I had my phone in my hand. I didn't realise. I had my phone in my hand while I was chasing Michael. Just love me. And I split the back of his head open. Um, but so anyway, so I got... Arrested and charged with that. I got put on 24-hour curfew and the police moved me to Palmerston North because just everything was still, you know, like this is like a week after the murder and things were still shady. Mm. And the police moved me over to emergency accommodation in Palmerston and they, I breached my curfew and they man and I managed to get bail again. And but so my bail conditions were not to be in Wanganui, not to associate with Michael, not to use drugs, you know, like your basic kind of wraparound bail conditions. But the two main ones were not to be in association with Michael and not to be in Wanganui. And I was pregnant as well. And so that was just and that was the day before I got moved to Palmy that I found that out. Um mm -hmm. and so I was still using during this time. Like I'm still actively using. Um I obviously when I found out I'm pregnant, I'm like, fuck, I need to really sort do something. I've got these charges. And then one night, because I was crazy in love with this stupid idiot, um, <laughs> I drove over to I drove over to Wanganui and booked a motel so that me and Michael could stay together while I'm on 24-hour curfew and pumps. So I'm not even allowed to leave my own house, mm. let alone be in Wanganui with Michael. You know, like I'd just done all the wrong things. And um, we ended up having a big argument the morning at like 6.30 because I wouldn't go and buy my back crack because I was really trying to not smoke meth at that stage. Mm. Um was failing, but I was trying. <laughs> um, and and I wouldn't buy him a bag of meat at six thirty in the morning before he went to work. And he fucking threw all this shit around and opened the motel door and said, "Call the police." Knowing I, was, you know, he got me arrested. You know, like he sent me to jail essentially. Oh, so I ended up going to jail. Um, mm. Pregnant in jail, we were almost at the rock bottom, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, not so quite. I ended, <laughs> I ended up pregnant in jail um, in Arahata, um, and. Yeah, that was that was hard. That was because when I'd been bailed the second time for breaching my curfew, the judge had said, "If you breach your curfew again, I have put in here that no one is to bail you; that you are to be incarcerated until your next um, revision date." Mm. And so when I got arrested that morning, and he knew that too, you know, Michael knew that too. So when I got arrested that morning, goosebumps, you know, like I knew, I knew I was going to jail before I even went before a judge. I knew the judge was going to, you know, it was just a matter of how long for. And so I only went to jail for 13 days. So I wasn't there for a really long time, but it's all long enough. Um, what for me was hard was it was so close to my friend's murder and I didn't know if the black yeah, I don't know if they knew that I wasn't a witness yet, you know, and that was really scary for me to be incarcerated somewhere where I knew there was strong gang affiliations and I wasn't sure if I was safe. But um, my auntie that I said had stolen my pregnancy test had been arrested the day before me, which I didn't know, and so she was in, in jail. And so she was best friends with the top dog. So it turned out I had a really, like, pleasant jail experience, I guess, you know, like, I was quite looked after and... But it was jail, none the fucking less, and it was not where I wanted to be. And mm. I had two older kids that I had to call. Where are you, mum? You know, I'm in jail, man. Mm. I, you know, like... Far out. There's nothing quite like sitting on that phone and talking to your mum when you're actually in jail. You know, like, there's nothing... There's nothing like the big... of the lights going out at night and that's it. You know, like... 
if you have an emergency, you push a buzzer and you hope, like, fuck, they actually answer it because they're quite useless at answering the buzzers. You know, like, it's mm. it was a scary place to be, especially pregnant. You know, I ended up getting sentenced and I got 10 months, 21 days home detention. Um, so I done my whole pregnancy in the first five months of Carter's life on home D. Oh, and I went to rehab when I was pregnant on home D. So I went to Red Door Recovery in Wellington and the place changed my life. And so I've been clean four years this year, um, but I was still in a really untoxic relationship with his father, which was really, really abusive. And so I spent the first like two and a half years of my clean time living with an addict, a really abusive addict. Um, and that was really, really difficult. Um, it tested me a lot and it really broke who I was as a person while I, which, while I was trying to recover, you know, and it was really difficult. Um, and I think because I had that need, just needed to be loved, you know, like I just wanted someone to love me. And I was like, if I stick it out, he might love me eventually, you know, like, but. Same thing. Yeah, but I had this sudden, yeah. not sudden realisation. I guess I just got to this stage where I realised it wasn't going to change, you know, like. And then I deserved better. Well, I don't even know if I thought I deserved better. It came down to Carter. I was sick of Carter witnessing what he was witnessing. Um, I was sick of him hearing the things he was hearing, seeing the things he was seeing, and I was sick of being scared in front of my kid. Um, mm. And it started to happen often, you know, like I was scared more than I was happy and that wasn't good. Um, and so I decided to leave Michael. I tried, you know, clearly I tried to leave him several times, but I decided to leave Michael and I got a protection order put in place. Um, and the same day I'd done that, I actually stumbled across a beautiful community where I met Richie. And that really has helped me as well to be surrounded by caring people. Um, if I'd lost so what child. things did you then have to change within you? I don't mean like lifestyle-wise, but what had you worked through that allowed you to then be clean for nearly four years? Um lots of elements to that yeah I really had to start with nourishing my body and I I done that with some amazing capsules I guess like anything it's nourishing your body well yeah. and then there comes yeah, exactly. a price yeah and there comes obviously that is so important but there's also the other side where your your mind and body becomes a balance yeah together. yeah the functions in my which I wasn't aware of at the time. You're like, I didn't know we had our nervous system and our gut health and our this and our that. And I just thought our body was a body, you know, and we ate and we slept and we, you know, just done things. Um, but I've learned a lot about my body over the last few years as well. Um, and so I started to really nourish it properly with plant-based products with, you know, like good things for your gut health because your gut and your mental health are so attached. And for me, my mental health was really struggling along with my like, energy you know like I was drained and to be that drained you can't even think about how you want to think about getting better you know like I just wanted to sleep and so, so once you, I started to feel better but were you so, like so you had a really healthy diet as well as taking lots of supplements was that no right? no so I am um, <laughs> which is why I love the supplements I take because they kind of bridge the gap between what you are meant to be eating and what you're doing when my body started to function my brain started to function a bit better too. And it was through that that I found a beautiful community that really... So the capsules I was taking, I joined the business that sells the capsules and through that business, I found a beautiful community of people. Um, and so through this community, I accessed personal development that I didn't even know was available. You know, like I thought the only way to like talk to someone was to go to a counsellor and counsellors really scared me. Um, because I was, I had no trust in people in general. I, you know, like I was a broken shell of a woman and I just, yeah, I was struggling, you know, like I was really struggling with where my place in the world was and where I fitted into other people's worlds. Um, and if I could even trust people and so I isolated a lot and then I kind of got pulled out of that, you know, like. People keep telling me that I was beautiful and like, I don't mean like, you're pretty beautiful, you know, like they're like, you're beautiful, you know, like mm. you're a good person. You are not that, you are, you know, like, and they started reinforcing into me what it had stripped from me for the last years. 
you know, like I've been told every day you're a piece of shit, you're ugly, you don't mean shit, no one wants you, you know, like, mm. and to have the opposite of that reinforced, and I didn't believe it. I was like, oh, this guy's talking shit, you know, like, <laughs> and like, you know, like I just did it, but I, I just kept listening to it, and eventually that grew on me, and I started to believe little bits of it myself. Mm. Um, and then I learned about self-talk, you know, like I learned about the way we speak to ourselves. Um, so this, um, like, support that you were getting, is this all um, still through the, the Juice Plus community that you're getting all that yeah. um, love and support? It was, yeah. yeah. Um, and it branched out, like, the amount of people you have access to through that community, you know, like... Mm. You for like this is the prime example, you know, like me and you would never have sat and talked if I hadn't met mm. Richie through my community. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for it. You know, like it's so much bigger than what people think it is. Mm. And like it's generally totally. changed my life. And Yeah, as I was from what I'd heard from it so yeah. far, I thought it was, you know, supplements, but actually it's like a whole emotional healing space. Like it community is. beyond just taking the supplements. I yeah, and part of our program is that so like your body's your vessel, you know, and it looks a certain way, and so many people are focused on how you look. Mm. But like our program is not just about your body, because mate, you can you can look however you want. It's about how you feel, and if you feel mm. healthy and your body's functioning properly, and you're comfortable mm. with how you look, you shouldn't have to look any other way. Um, and our program is real focused on mind, body, and soul. And I love that because it's not just that physical element. And so part of the program that came with my subs, that came with my business, was these self-love guides. You know, these 30 days of gratitude, these 30 days of self-love, these soul cleansers, these, you know, all these resources that are readily available. Mm. And, and that like, self-love one is key, isn't it? Because the whole way yeah. through your story today, the theme was always needing to feel loved by other people. And, and then I learned that that was, But where's the love for you? And so it, and it sounds like initially it still needed to come from other people. It was still the community telling you you're a beautiful, lovely person. Yeah. But at some point that transitions into you being able to tell yourself that. Yeah. And then I, I, um, it took a long time. I had to learn. I messed with my ex probably for another four or five months. Um, you know, that dumb run back to them because I was lonely. I knew I didn't want to be with him, but I was scared to be with anybody. Else. I didn't want to be with anybody else. And I was still terrified. He, like, just to put this in perspective, we've been split up. I'm in another relationship. I'll get there, but he still harasses me he, to the stage where he's blocked on everything and he started sending me emails. You know, like he's on home D for breaching protection orders and he still goes, you know, like this guy's got some problems. But, um, and so I, you know, I've done that for a few months and then one day I was like, no, I believed what someone told me. All of a sudden I was like, actually, you know what? And I remember the phone call clear as day. He was like, you're a fucking slut. You're a piece of shit. Mm. You know, none of which is true. And I was like, fuck you. I said, I'm fucking beautiful and I'm amazing and people value me and I value people. And I hung up on him and then I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like, and I, I still remember it because it was the first time I had stood up for myself and mm, so okay, fucking no, wrong. No, no. And I don't no, even know no. if I believed it when I was saying it. But I said it, and that was the start of something for me, you know. To and luckily, things. luckily, with the venom you said it in, hey, mm. the, yeah. the venom in which you said it reinforced that subconscious bloody thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly. it didn't go and back to default and say yes, I'm right. Too. Yeah, man, that was that was the mm. way to actually change the pattern. Yeah, well done. It, yeah. Man. it sounds and like you know that your your head knew that to be true now because people have told mm. you and you've heard it and you've gone, yeah, that's logical. But it was when you said it was such venom, it brings it into your yeah, heart yeah. and your gut. Yeah. And once you absorb it into your body, that's where you really start believing it. And so then after I finally kind of made that decision that I was like, no, actually, fuck you. Um, I decided that I needed to be by myself. And that was the first time in my whole entire life that I had been alone. Um, I think I had always surrounded myself with people, with friends, with a boyfriend, with a, you know, like anything just to not be by myself. And I sat uncomfortably for a very long time. Um, and I eventually 
got a wee bit more comfortable. I started to love myself. I started to trust myself first, I think. I think I started to trust myself that I was capable of making good decisions, that I was capable of being a person again, you know, like that I was worthy. I started to believe that stuff. So on, on Amira's thing, so Amira, like all the things that we've heard from you, like a lot of these underpinning emotions that that drove you, right? So there was a lot of resentment, guilt, using drugs to camouflage it. There was a lot of fear-based stuff because of the relationship. So mm. a lot of distrust for yourself and people around you, the people you surrounded yourself with had a massive impact in your life, self-sabotaging a lot, your belief was low, and then at one point when you got to crisis, crisis point, you, de- you made a decision to change yeah. because of many factors around your kids and because you just hated the way your life was. So if there was a message that you were to give out today, what would you say to the people that are going through the current situation that you're in? And so my thing is to just reach out to someone. Um, NA has been amazing for me. If you're in my situation in recovery and you're not sure where to go, um, there's NA meetings everywhere. Um, Jump online. Um, Narcotics Anonymous. Right. Yeah, so it's yeah, like so alcohol Narcotics phenomenal. Anonymous and alcohol, uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous are both yeah. good ones that you think are good for people to reach out yeah. to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there, so that's addicts supporting addicts. There's no mm. chief there. There's no leader. That's just a bunch of addicts supporting addicts, and you get some really beautiful stuff from that. But honestly, believe in yourself. Um, learn to trust yourself and help someone else install your value in you until you believe it yourself as well mm. and I think that's really important is those things you don't believe when someone compliments you like how you used to always be like nah I got told off for that once you know someone's like oh you're pretty be like nope I got to say thank mm. you even if you don't believe it and I think that's really important if someone compliments you thank them for it because you yeah. start to believe it if you know like be kind to yourself if you are kinder to yourself other people can be mm. kind back Mm. love yourself and then you're capable of loving others and I heard it all but it didn't make sense until it made sense and when it does Mm. your life changes babe like you just won't ever look back just reach out man Mm. drop my link somewhere if you can talk to me talk to whoever you need to but talk to someone join the juice plus community yeah yeah do whatever you need to do yeah absolutely (laughs) um thanks for your time as always I mean you've always been open open to everything you just seriously you you're so vulnerable in so so many ways but so strong in many other ways so i really appreciate your time today uh, i love you you're uh, doing a great job and uh, that is our show today mm. and that was pretty compelling shit so thank yeah. you and i and if you do like this program and you do want to share or like please do and send it out to people that you mm. think may want to hear the story yeah so that is us for today thanks for your time mira catch up soon no worries and we'll be back next week with steve gurney who um had um he's a one way west the coast to coast what, nine, nine times. times but after the second time he nearly died um had an illness so bad in between that he was in icu for a couple of weeks um, and he came back from all that for another seven wins um cannot wait so we'll be hearing about that next week 